This is Swing, 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 a celebration of swing music. I'm Kenetra Miller, coordinator of vocal jazz studies at Howard University. And in this segment, Gypsy Jazz. We think of jazz as being American music. There are some people who even call it America's classical music. Jazz was invented here and it was perfected here. That's all true. But there's one form of jazz, a form that'll make you smile or make you cry, but will definitely make you swing. And that one comes from another place and another culture altogether. This is the music that's come to be known as Gypsy Jazz or Gypsy Swing. And it's not just some fancy title. It was created in the 1930s by two men, one of whom, Django Reinhardt, was one of the Roma people, an honest-to-goodness gypsy. Being Hungarian gypsy Roma, the term gypsy jazz really confused me at first. That's Tony Baylog. He's a gypsy violinist in San Francisco, one of dozens of players who carry on the Django tradition today. People consider gypsy jazz gypsy music. It's been a major influence, I think, for all uh, Roma musicians all over the world because of his uniqueness, you know. Traditional Eastern European folklore music is sort of passe now because of gypsy jazz. think of gypsy music, you probably think of something like this. This is Tony Baylog playing at a festival in 2008. This kind of music is actually the root of gypsy jazz. It's the music that Django Reinhardt drew from when he was creating this totally unique form of jazz in the 1930s. Django Reinhardt was born in Belgium, but Tony Baylog says... He was from a group of gypsies that called themselves Manouche. His father's last name was Weiss, but Tony says... It's very common for the Roma people to take their mother's name. Her last name was Reinhardt. Django, by the way, is a gypsy name. In the Roma language, it means, somebody woke me up. Django played violin and banjo when he was young, but instead of classical music or traditional gypsy tunes, Django was a fan of early American jazz, particularly Louis Armstrong. This is a Louis Armstrong record called Dallas Blues. The story goes that Django heard this song and it completely changed the direction of his life. He was listening to uh, Louis Armstrong, he called his brother, so he was just mimicking his music, but in sort of an aroma tradition. Django's music was mostly like what you're hearing right now, clarinet, brass, and castanets, until the early 1930s when everything changed again. Those were the years after Django Reinhardt met Stefan Grappelli. He was like, I think, nine or ten years old. They called it busking. So he would use a street performer playing the violin on streets corners in Paris. So some, through mutual friends, when he was a teenager, he hooked up with Django. Grappelli had studied music performance and harmony at the Paris Conservatory. When Grappelli joined the band, Django Reinhardt's music took off like a rocket on both sides of the Atlantic. Django, when he had these two rhythm guitar players playing, they were playing boom chuck, boom chick, boom chick, boom chick. They they were just keeping a basic rhythm. But when Stefan was soloing, he would add all these nuances and these different rhythms and these he would play these little riffs out of nowhere, you know, that made it so distinctive, you know. J. 
Gypsy jazz was being played during the time in the 1930s that's called the swing era. Before then, jazz had been more structured and predictable. You can probably hear it here, and if you can, compare it to the swing era. You hear that? It's bouncier, and it's more free. They're playing the same notes, but they're also playing notes between the notes. And the soloist is allowed to pick his own rhythm. That's swing. And that's what was just starting when Django first started playing with Stefan Grappelli. The swing era ended after World War II, but the gypsy sound of Django Reinhardt is still swinging today. You can hear it any night in clubs all over the U.S. and Europe, where it's kept alive by musicians like Tony Balog. I think the first time I heard Django's recordings, I was about 14. As we said, Tony's a gypsy too. His parents and aunts and uncles played him lots of gypsy music as a kid but he'd never heard anything like Django before. I loved a Django. I thought, this guy is unbelievable. I mean, who are these guys that I've never heard anybody? And I had so many relatives, and you heard other records of uh, the American jazz guitar players of the time, and, you know, it was just amazing to me how they played so well together. They read each other. And the rhythms, you know, being young and energetic, you know, you wanted to play faster than the speed of light. So that was amazing to me. He set out to play like Django and Grappelli, just as fast and with just as much skill. I tried to mim mim mimic him, and his early records was very technical, so you'd have to spend a lot of time learning them lines. If, if you're going to be a Django guitar player, you have to be very, very well versed on your instrument. And violin, forget it. I mean, it's very difficult. That's Tony playing. I think you can hear he's worked hard over the years. It's safe to say he wanted to play like Django, and he's done it. Everybody says, do you know any Django songs? And I said, sure, I know a lot of them. In Chicago, at the famous Green Mill, we had a young and an older audience. The younger audience were mostly young Europeans that came here and that they wanted to hear that European flavor of music in the jazz setting. Thousands and thousands of Eastern Europeans live in Chicago, where Tony used to play. Having a million Polish people, I think 900,000 of them came on Wednesday nights, you know. <laughs> I really like your violin playing you play so well. Are you Polish? No, I'm not Polish. And it turns out it's not just Europeans, and it's not just gypsies. And it's not just jazz musicians who are falling for Django's music. Tony tells a story about being at a folk music festival in Montana where he heard this great young violinist named Michael Cleveland. And we went to see his show and he had violin, two guitars, mandolin and bass and the whole band sang and they were exceptional. <laughs> That's Michael you're hearing right now, and you can hear he doesn't play jazz at all, he plays bluegrass. After this concert, Tony went back to the hotel where all the musicians were staying, and a bunch of them were sitting around the lobby with their instruments when Michael walked in. And did we mention, Michael Cleveland is blind. So he walks into the lobby and says, Tony? I said, yeah, it's me, Michael. I said, come on, man, grab a seat. And he played songs that he's never heard before, and it was fantastic. They started to jam on Django's version of Sweet Georgia Brown. As it happens, someone was there in the lobby with a cell phone camera. He put their jam session up on YouTube. The 
Remember, Michael's not a jazz musician, but there's something about this music. Django's music just gets inside you. This guy had no idea, but he had such great ears, and this, the, you know, he knows so much about chord patterns and progressions and everything. He sat right in and didn't make a mistake, and he soloed on the song maybe 10 times of these 32-bar songs. And I just looked at him. I said, Michael, I'm starting to hate you. <laughs> The guy was truly amazing, amazing a violinist, you know, so talented, and he just tore that song up. Django Reinhardt may have died in 1953, but it's clear, violinists and guitar players, gypsy and otherwise, are doing all they can to see that his legacy and his music live on. Thanks for listening. I'm Kenetra Miller of Howard University for Arts Edge, a program of the Education Department of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Music